Kumanana, an Afro-Peruvian musical review. Experience the power of the African beats and the resilience of a people that spurred change in a culture. Victoria and Nicomera Santa Cruz led the resurgence of Afro-Peruvian arts in the 1960s and 70s. Their efforts provided powerful resistance to their marginalization at a crucial moment in history. Be part of the movement, June 7th through June 25th at Gala Theater in Northwest DC. Information and tickets at galatheater.org. Today on CityCast DC, there is a big fight going on over adding more flights to the airport formerly known as National Airport. Which side should you be on? Plus, our pal Britt Peterson is here to talk about her bang-up Washingtonian story about the scandal at a once-celebrated refuge for trans kids in D.C. She has allegations of scams and other juicy details. Plus, CityCast DC's Priyanka Tilva is here with some Juneteenth events for you. Today is Friday, June 16th. I'm Michael Schaefer, and here's what D.C. is talking about. My Twitter feed, at least, and maybe yours too, if you follow stuff in politics or in D.C. politics, has been flooded lately with ads about this question of the perimeter rule at National Airport. And that is the historic rule that this airport was supposed to be just for short haul flights of under like 1,250 miles, not for long haul flights. The rule has been sort of adjusted over the years, uh, about 20 some years ago, they changed it so that there could be 20 long-haul flights a day. There's now a push to add even more long-haul flights to the airport. And if you believe the people who are against it, this is going to be a crisis because it's going to lead to all kinds of more delays, 33% more delays at this already delay-prone airport, and it will destroy regional airports, which apparently you know not benefiting from it. If you believe the uh, proponents, it's actually great because instead of having to schlep to Dallas or BWI, you will be able to catch more flights to the West Coast or other places far away from DCA, right, sort of within almost within walking distance of downtown. And presumably those prices will also come down a little bit. You won't have to pay as much of a premium to fly out of there as you have done. This is like an old fight in DC. And it goes back to like the beginning of like Dulles Airport, uh, the kind of unspoken in here is like one big reason for people being wary of more flights from National is it's noisy. The flights come right down the river and so on. Back in the old days, you used to have to have longer runways and bigger, noisier planes to fly longer distances. That's not really true anymore. Planes have changed. So a lot of the reasons why they limited this are gone. So now there is just convenience, money, and nimbyism. Yeah, the thing with this, though, is like I have such a hard time knowing what side to be on because everyone speaking about it has a business interest involved. You know, like there are no trustworthy actors here. Like one of the main opponents to adding more long haul flights is American Airlines. But that's because DCA is their hub. And if long haul flights can be added, then a bunch of other airlines are going to come in. There's going to be more competition for them. And they don't want that. The crazy thing about it is the the issue, it, it kind of cuts across politics. The governor of Virginia, who's ordinarily a great friend of business, um, he says he's happy with the current split between the airports. And I presume that's because he's got to answer the voters around there who don't want more flights and who are convinced that this is going to lead to more noise and hassle and inconvenience for them. Uh, June 8th, Dill in uh, Axios had a piece about how Senator Warnock from Georgia has uh, endorsed more long-haul flights from DCA, because this is mm-hmm. be- because of the governance of the Washington area, that there's a federal role in this, that there wouldn't be someplace else. And if, it's no coincidence that Atlanta is the home of Delta. And I, I presume they're a major uh, business constituent of his who would benefit from flying people to like Salt Lake City, which is another one of their hubs. Absolutely. Also, like the whole thing does feel a little skeevy to me because they keep trying to bring in arguments of supposed patriotism into it. Like, Washingtonians deserve more options and Americans all over the country deserve more options to fly to the nation's capital. And it's like, let's not pretend right, that there's right. anything altruistic <laughs> about this fight. This is ridiculous. The, the senator from Wyoming was one of the, like, I don't think there's going to be flights to Casper, like no matter what. Right. Yeah, maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> but I mean, here's the thing. I think historically there's been this like sort of idea that like it's 
bad to have more flights from national. It, it's polluting and noisy. And the noble thing is to schlep to Dulles, which is, you know, <laughs> was at least in the middle of nowhere. It's not really anymore. If you're going to fly long distance and actually, like w when I kind of examine that or, you know, think about that, like, well, wait a minute, why should, you know, I have to schlep an hour to a further away airport or pay more to fly from someplace that like I, you know, on a very micro level, I generate less carbon footprint by going to DCA than by going to Dulles. And why should I have to pay more to fly from, a, you know, an airport close to town is like a great amenity for a, a place. And I don't know, I'm with you, I don't know who to believe on the like, will this cause more delays? One of the big other big yeah. opponents of this is United, which has a hub at Dulles. So all its stuff is out there. And if, again, if you had more options at National, you wouldn't be stuck in their ecosystem. But I'm kind of like this, the, the kind of the old like DC Patriot view was like, no, we must like not allow Congress to push more flights onto DCA. But like, actually, like that on a very selfish level, that might be good for me. Of course, I'm not under the flight path, but I would literally do anything to avoid going to Dulles. So anything <laughs> that like, allows me to not go to Dallas ever again in my life, I'm 100% for. I'm so with you, Britt. It wouldn't make National a place like you could get a flight to, you know, Frankfurt or something. It would just probably mean like more flights to San Francisco or Los Angeles or, or so on. The noise factor, which, you know, historically was such a big thing, I just, it's like planes have kind of changed. And I mean, I, I think the aggregate number of flights that is a thing that is relevant if you're under the flight path. But whether those flights are going to Chicago or to San Diego is a, a lot less important. Totally. The delays thing also doesn't really make sense to me because, like, wouldn't you just plan for flights to land and take off at appropriate times according to how many are coming in and going? Like, I just don't understand the argument for why this would create delays. But it is a emotion wrenching one, I guess, because I frequently experience delays going to and from DCA. And so mentioning that does make me nervous about this plan. What is the reasoning for why it would cause more delays? Th that's what I don't get. They say that there is such limited capacity at National that if they were to add a bunch more flights, then there's like some somewhere around 30 percent chance that there will be way more delays. I don't understand why they wouldn't be able to plan around that. Yeah, I think the airline industry uh, suggesting that the delays are a result of airport location seems mm -hmm. a little dubious to me. <laughs> totally with you. Did you know that fashion is often used to confirm identities, challenge social structures, and display personalities within the indigenous community? It is fascinating. And to learn more about how fashion shows up in culture, check out Youth in Action, Wearing Our Pride, a fascinating panel discussion that's available now online on demand. It's part of Youth in Action, Conversations About Our Future, an online series hosted by the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of the American Indian. These moderated panel discussions serve as a national platform to amplify the efforts of Native changemakers from across the Western Hemisphere who are engaged in civic and social justice work for the Indigenous peoples. Just go to AmericanIndian.si.edu to learn more. Ahoy, land lovers! It's not just about seafood at Long John Silver's. Get a $6 chicken basket with all white meat chicken and your choice of side and hush puppies. The chicken is hand batter dipped and fried to golden perfection. And then top it off with a slice of cheesecake from the Cheesecake Factory Bakery. The $6 chicken basket is available for a limited time. Order online today at ljsilvers.com. All right, so Britt, you are here because you wrote this great story in uh, Washingtonian in the current issue. And it's about the rise and fall of Casa Ruby, which was a place that got a lot of awards. It, it was a sort of refuge, particularly for homeless trans kids. The person behind it, Ruby Carrado, her reputation has kind of fallen apart. She's split town. This is like a kind of rollicking, a, a very sad, but it's like a novel compared to the Anna Delvey story in, in your <laughs> article. Can you tell us about it? So basically, the way the story started was last summer, the Post reported that um, Casa Ruby had closed all its locations, that, you know, probably a dozen and least more employees who've been working over the last few months with very little pay were just kind of being chucked out, in some cases, up to $10,000 in pay that they weren't receiving. 
Meanwhile, Ruby Corrado, who was this like illustrious figure and the symbol of sort of like what a trans person building themselves up from homelessness could accomplish and what they could give back to the community, she had just like bolted to El Salvador where she was like not in contact with anyone, uh, ignoring press requests, um, just kind of like hiding out. Over the course of the past year, the DC Attorney General filed a civil complaint against Ruby that had like all these like horrific details about mismanagement, lack of pay, and then like on a very massive scale, uh, financial mismanagement. She was uh, like just moving large chunks of money through different LLCs into her private accounts. She was just like taking cash out from ATMs from the Casa Ruby accounts. She was essentially treating the Casa Ruby account like it was her private money. And over time, as we've learned more and more and more details have come out about this, and it's this really, really shocking and to me, incredibly devastating story about this nonprofit that purported to do so much good. Um, and then over time has just set off an explosion in the middle of an already very vulnerable and marginalized community. Can you go back a sec to, so Casa Ruby at its peak, you mentioned yeah. it had a couple of locations. What was it? Where did the money come from? What did it purport to do? What did it actually do? So uh, Ruby Corrado had founded Cus Ruby in 2012. And at the time when she founded it, you know, she was using her social security disability check to essentially rent out a single floor in a townhouse on Georgia Avenue. It started as this super humble, just basically a living room, like trans sex workers, trans kids on the street were kind of coming, getting food, getting money if they needed it, getting, you know, she would sort of buy them things out of her own pocket. Over time, and especially as Ruby herself uh, sort of developed all this political clout, she was getting um, hundreds of thousands of dollars every year from the government. She was getting million dollar private grants um, from different like funders. Um, and it built up into this massive enterprise where she had, you know, many different locations. She was running like many, many different programs at once. Uh, there was like an HIV medication program. There was a program for LGBTQ asylum seekers from other countries. There were a bunch of different youth programs. You know, it was just on a very large scale. And it was providing services that really didn't exist at that time in DC. There's organizations like SMILE, Wanda Alston Foundation, uh, HIPS. There are groups that do this work, but she was hitting a very specific niche, which was trans people, trans people of color, trans uh, like Spanish speakers, and um, providing services that just didn't exist at the time. And she was like, you know, a big enough deal that I remember there was a scandal involving like a, a racial incident of some sort at an LGBT bar. And they basically hired Ruby to come in and like check their policies to make sure they, I mean, she was basically the you know validator of their not being racist anymore um, in the court of public opinion. So she was, a, she was like a, a enough of a celebrity that she had that kind of impact. At one point, someone called Ruby, and this wasn't in the story, but she was like, she was everyone's trans friend, you know? She was sort of the person that you brought in to like show that you weren't racist or show that you weren't transphobic. So it was this bar Nelly's uh, where a black woman was pulled down the stairs by her hair by a security guard. It was tremendously controversial at the time. This was summer of 2021. And they hired Ruby as like a diversity consultant, which actually made a lot of people upset because she's not black. Um, and the black queer community was very skeptical of Ruby and had been for a long time. So this moment was actually one where some of these fissures that have been boiling up in the community for forever kind of like burst into view because some, for the first time, people were attacking Ruby in public, which they hadn't really done before. Something that uh, surprised me a little bit in my reporting was how much people knew about Ruby going back. I think for people who weren't closely following this story, the revelations in the Washington Post article last summer were really a shock. And, and devastating and saddening. But a lot of people knew and had known for years that there were major, major problems at Casa Ruby. Um, those people included activists in the community. They obviously included employees and residents. And it also included the DC government. The DC government had known for a really, really long time that there were serious problems. So why didn't they do anything? <laughs> I mean, that's a huge question and I don't think I've answered it. I, I would love to know more about the inside story there. Um, I did a ton of foying. I was able to kind of like track a trail of people investigating. So I found an email at one point uh, from a DHS investigator telling a department administrator that between 2016 and 2017, there had been 337 complaints about Casa Ruby. Wow. And that the department at that time was running 27 separate investigations 
on charges ranging from fraud to sexual assault of minors. We know that the fraud investigation ended up leading to the criminal complaint, and we don't know what happened to the other investigations, including the sexual assault of minors, which to me is a big open question. So is it like, you know, everyone was like psyched that they had a trans friend and they didn't want to blow the whistle on her? I mean, that's what a lot of people said. Ruby was larger than life. She was a symbol. She wasn't just a person. And her organization was kind of larger than life, too. I think to look at it charitably, you could say they wanted the services that she provided and nobody else provided them. But you could also look at it uncharitably and say that they just were scared to take her down. They were scared of the bad news story and they just nobody did anything. So what about the services that were being offered now Casa Ruby has been closed for almost a year? Where are people turning? Is there a place for trans youth in the city? So right when Department of Human Services closed Ruby, they did open another house for uh, LGBTQ youth. Also, when Casa Ruby closed, all of the major providers in this area kind of got together and they were like, what do we do? This is an emergency. So a lot of groups, including um, Smile, Wanda Olsen, and a couple of others, kind of like banded together to see if they could provide some of the services that Ruby was providing. Um, And that has included things like giving their caseworkers extra training in Spanish language, uh, Spanish language outreach, adding beds and things like that. So at this point, numerically, there are as many beds as there were when Casa Ruby closed. There's an equivalence. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say that those beds are of equal value. They're not in one place. They're not centralized. And you don't have that spirit that Casa Ruby really had. I mean, a lot of people told me, like, when you're dealing with LGBTQ youth, word of mouth and reputation are everything. Casa Ruby, people would bring in their friends. They would say, this is a place you can be out. This is a place you can be safe. And new organizations coming in won't always have that word of mouth. And that means a lot. LGBTQ youth, especially trans youth, are incredibly skeptical of traditional shelters. They've received a lot of abuse in them. Traditional shelters are often run by religious groups. They're often gender segregated. They're not always places that trans people are going to be comfortable. And they're often places where trans people have been explicitly hurt or discriminated against. So to have that one place that provided that deep, deep comfort where all the staffers are queer, where all the staffers are queer people of color, it's very, very difficult to replace that. The thing that's so sad is that even this place that did have that sense of comfort and reputation, you mentioned more than 300 complaints. Yeah. So yeah, it yeah, sounds yeah. like even if Casa Ruby did have that sterling reputation, there wasn't a place for people even then. Yeah. I mean, the sad thing was, like, with all of those things, it was still the best that we had. When I talked to people in the community around Casa Ruby, who had been very, very critical of Ruby, very critical of Casa Ruby going back years, I was like, well, why didn't people talk to the D.C. government? Why didn't people take a more aggressive approach to making some of these changes? And they would be like, well, like it it was all we had. We didn't have anything else, you know. So despite all of the very, very serious and frightening things that people told me that were going on there, it was better than nothing. Let me ask you like the big like reader question, because I really I recommend everyone read your piece. So we've got it's like a cinematic tale, right? You have this person, she's using her disability checks to like fund good works. And eventually she becomes like celebrated for this. And a lot of public money comes in. She's able to expand her empire. There are signs that everything is not what it seems to be. And then it kind of turns to ashes. And was it a scam all along or was it a, a person where it just sort of got bigger than she could actually manage? I'm asking you for your gut reaction here because I think like the factually we don't know. But to, right, what do you think? Right. I mean, I spent so much time thinking about this and asking people. And then I spent, you know, five hours on a really wacky Zoom with Ruby herself. I think my gut reaction at this point, and I think the thing I want to say to preface this, Ruby's job was so hard. You know, I think it's I think it's difficult as even for me as someone who's never done this work to understand just how difficult, draining, demoralizing the work that she did really was. And she did that work for years. And I honestly think that she just at a certain point believed that she deserved to retire with a lot of money to El Salvador. And I don't think it was a scam all along. I think she was I think she went into it with a vision like a real vision from the heart and so much passion. I mean, when we talked, like, 
she clearly loved the people that she served, even though she ended up allegedly stealing all this money from them. She has vociferously across the board denied all the allegations. She has claimed that the board approved everything she did. That does not appear to be true, but that is her claim. And that passion was still there. That passion was really apparent. I don't believe that it was all some kind of like hoax from the beginning. I think a problem with Casa Ruby from the outset is how closely entangled the organization was with a human. You know, I mean, it's named after her, right? And she is not someone who had any training at all in social work, you know, or any experience running a nonprofit or anything like that. And I think that lack of boundaries, I saw that all over the place in terms of how she dealt with clients, you know, creating these family-like relationships with clients, which like, that's not good for the clients. That's not good for you. You know, she was so emotionally drawn into her work and it led to her overstepping boundaries in every single way all the time. And I think one major boundary that she overstepped at a certain point was just she came to believe that the money was for her and it, she acted that way. I mean, she was taking cash out from ATMs as if it was her money, but it wasn't. But again, I see that as sort of like one example of these larger boundary issues that were kind of at the heart of what Casa Ruby was and also were part of what made it so powerful too, to have this symbolic figure, to have this person who's so personally invested. But then the ugly side of that is that they start to believe that they're owed money and they're owed things due to this intense personal investment. So it is a long weekend. It didn't use this weekend didn't used to be a long weekend, but it has been for the last few years celebrating Juneteenth, which is the day commemorating, I believe, historically when slaves in Texas learned of emancipation, but is a national uh, celebration. Fun fact, it's also my wedding anniversary. Oh, that's what we're really celebrating. Uh, that's what we're, yes, exactly. I'm the real <laughs> beneficiary here. But there's a bunch of stuff going on uh, in town, none of it apparently related to my wedding anniversary. <laughs> and Priyanka's got a pretty cool rundown of it. Yeah, there are so many events. And so I had our newsletter editor, Kayla, help me whittle down the ones that seem the best, which if you haven't subscribed to our newsletter, Hey DC, you should do that so that you can always get fun events like this. Um, I'll just kind of run through the list because there's some cool ones. At Metro Bar, which somehow always seems to have the best events in the city always, they're doing this Chocolate City pop-up art market and art fair. So that there will be local artisans, there'll be vendors, there'll be go-go music, food truck, graffiti demonstrations. They're also going to have signature Chocolate City cocktails. Um, so that's pretty fun. That's on Saturday from 12 to 5. Again, at Metro Bar, it is free entry. Obviously, you'll have to pay for any crafts that you buy there or drinks that you buy there, but it sounds like it's going to be a real party. Then down at the mall, competing timing, because this is from 11 to 3 on Saturday, so you'll kind of have to pick and choose. But down at the National Mall um, at the Museum of African American History and Culture, they're having a Juneteenth Community Day. Again, there will be music and arts and crafts, but also there are going to be all of these interesting workshops about different types of foods. So they're going to be selling okra, hibiscus, and fish pepper, which I've never heard of. And so they'll talk about the history of fish pepper, and they're going to do demonstrations on okra pickling, which again, I've never thought of. And then there will also be African drumming and storytelling with folk tales from Africa and the African diaspora that focus on gardens, growing, cooking, and of course, Juneteenth. So those are all of the activities that are happening outside the museum because everything happening inside, unfortunately, is sold out. But I think it's really cool that they thought to have this like walk-in option for people. Of those two, if you had to pick, which one would you go to? Oh, the Juneteenth community day at the museum sounds amazing. I love being outside. I love getting my kids to the mall. I would absolutely do that one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I guess as far as kid-friendly goes, that's definitely the winner. So good point. Family-friendly at the mall. I think I'm an art market guy, but that's because I haven't bought an anniversary present uh -huh. yet. So. <laughs> you got to move. Yeah. There you go. On Saturday... Britt will take her kids to the museum. Mike will buy his wife an anniversary present very late. Um, <laughs> and then on Sunday, you can go to the Brooklyn Arts Walk, where they're going to be celebrating Juneteenth with all Black-owned businesses, performances, crafts, music. Again, this is free. And Sunday also happens to be Father's Day. So maybe take your dad along or buy a present for your dad. On Saturday, buy a present for Mike and his wife. On Sunday, buy a present for your dad. <laughs> And then Monday, which is actually Juneteenth, there are fitness classes at Franklin Park, dance classes and yoga. And then also they'll have like vendors and wellness classes and whatnot. You could go to Georgetown for a walking tour of Black Georgetown. 
and learn about the oldest African-American burial grounds in D.C., or you could go to Anacostia, to the Anacostia Community Museum. They're going to have local bands, gardening workshops, double dutch, which is the thing that I would go for, and a bunch of other activities out there. All of those are during the day on Monday. Hopefully you've got the day off just like we do. Oh, well, so I have the day off, but I'm actually going to Bethany Beach. So if there are Juneteenth events at Bethany Beach, I will definitely be going to them. But otherwise, I'll just have to miss this for this year and come back next year. Yes. Well, now you know what you're missing out on. If I were here, I'd definitely go to the gardening workshop. That sounds incredible. It does. I agree. All right, Priyanka, you have our uh, DC life hack for the week. Yeah. Okay. So this is something I learned on Twitter. Rare moment of good news coming from Twitter. Did you know that you could get free Washington Post and New York Times subscription access with your DC public library card? I didn't believe it when I saw the tweet, so then I tested it out, but it's true. So you just, if you, we'll have the links in our show notes, but also if you just Google like Washington Post DC Public Library, it sends you to a DCPL landing page that if you click through to the Washington Post or to the New York Times through there, they already have like the redeemed code filled out for you. And it's a temporary free subscription and you can do it as many times as you want. So it's, pretty much a permanent free subscription, um, which I just thought was wild. Well, thanks, Priyanka. You just took a bunch of money out of the pockets of, uh, of our leading. I know. <laughs> I know. I was going to say. I know. I felt a little <laughs> bit guilty sharing this hack, but it's too good to not. Good for Priyanka, bad for journalism. Yes. <laughs> and on that note, that is all for today here on CityCast DC. And heads up, we are off for Juneteenth on Monday, so we will be back in your feeds on Tuesday. Britt Peterson, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. And Priyanka, always awesome to have you. Thank you. Our lead producer is Priyanka Tilve. Our producer is Julia Karen. Our newsletter writer is Kayla Cote Stemmerman. Our production assistant is Susanna Brown. And our hosts are Bridget Todd and me, Michael Schaefer from Politico. Music is by Alex Roldan. If you enjoyed the show, why not hire a skywriting plane from either DCA or Dulles? Write it in the sky. See you on Tuesday. Bye. What do you think, Brett? I zoned out for a second. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> I- <laughs>